love to argue and fight about almost everything regarding nutrition, but one thing that seems to be agreed upon across almost everyone is that you want to maximize nutrient intake, right? You've heard these things. Eat nutrient-dense or nutrient-rich foods. And you've heard micronutrients and macronutrients. And hell, think of the word itself, nutrition or nutritious. It all seems to be centered around this one concept, nutrients. But have you ever stopped to ask yourself, what the hell does that actually even mean? Well, like, I think my nutrients means like a lot of vitamins and minerals. But if we're all going to believe that this is probably one of the few central defining core principles of a high quality diet, we might want to know what nutrients means more than just like maybe some vitamins or minerals, I think, or something. We can do better than that. So in this episode of 25 Minute Fizz, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Explain to you what are these nutrients, what that means, and we'll cover all of them, right? So how do your vitamins and minerals and macros and all of that play a role in explaining and understanding what nutrients are? So I'll take a piece of food and I'll walk you through exactly what is in all that food you consume so you can understand exactly what it means to have a nutrient-dense diet or a nutrient-rich diet. Now, for those of you that are new to the crew, my name is Andy Galpin. I'm a full professor and scientist in the Center for Sport Performance at Cal State Fullerton. I've got a PhD in human bioenergetics, a master's in human movement sciences, and I've been working with elite athletes and conducting research on all things human performance for almost 20 years now. So trust me when I say this, friends, you're now rocking with the best. Now, in case you haven't heard yet, my jam is to educate, inspire, and entertain all of you by presenting to you the science of strength and conditioning, nutrition, and basically everything human physiology. And I do that by giving away all of my knowledge for free in these five 25 and 55 minute physiology videos because I believe so much that this knowledge should be free and accessible to anyone in the world with a basic internet connection and not stuck behind the paywall of some university or journal. Now, I've been doing this for a couple of years now and I have to stop quickly and thank all of you who've supported me thus far. There's no way I could have done this without all of you. So for those of you friends who've provided support over the last couple of years, I can't thank you enough. And I promise, if y'all keep chipping in, I'm going to keep chopping it up and giving you everything I got to help you along your way. That being said, let's talk some science. Oh, and before we get started, a fair warning. If any of you have ever been in my class or worked with me as an athlete, you know I'm not the best with counting in numbers. So when I say 25 minutes, maybe 12, maybe 38, I don't know, close enough. All right, so let's start with a piece of food. It doesn't matter what it is, but let's assume it's a giant piece of pizza, fantastic. Basically, everything inside of it can be broken down into two major categories. Non-nutrients, or some call these anti-nutrients, so don't worry about that for now, and nutrients. All right, so anything you see following these categories on the right-hand side or your left-hand side will be a nutrient, and the other side, of course, will be technically considered a non-nutrient. In order for that distinction to take place, mostly scientists will say that it has to fall into this category. It has to be used by an organism to grow, reproduce, or survive. It can be used in two major functions, inside the cell in the form of metabolism or excreted by the cell and used as structure. Think uh, fingernails or a shell in the case of an animal or anything like that. Okay, so if it doesn't hit this definition, technically it's considered to be a non-nutrient. That doesn't mean it's not important or harmful, it just doesn't hit this category. So inside the nutrients, we have three main subcategories, macros, minerals, and vitamins. All right now, you'll see this little Carolina blue line that heads down to the minerals and the vitamins. So what this means is everything below these categories, we typically tell people to consume them in a minimum or higher fashion. So in other words, we say, make sure you have this minimal amount of this vitamin, or don't go lower than this. Now that's separate from what you'll see a little bit later. And that's not the case, as you see for the macros, because that's not your fancy blue line. So that's kind of also showing you how this whole schematic is going to work. The blue box is what we consider to be essential. Now this doesn't mean, and it's not synonymous with important or necessary. The technical definition here means your body cannot synthesize it, so you therefore have to consume it in your diet. So vitamins just categorically are almost always considered essential. Your body doesn't do them. This is different for different animals, right? So again, I'm mostly concerned with humans here because that's what I assume most of you are. A great example here would be vitamin C. So we know that it's essential. We have to consume it in our diet, but other animals don't. 
they can synthesize it themselves. So it wouldn't be considered essential for them while it is for us. This little gold box, if you will, signifies inorganic. So everything else on this list, except for one thing that we'll get to later, is organic, meaning it has a, meaning it has a carbon molecule attached to it. Uh, the minerals, as you see, are not that. They're rocks. They're made from the earth. Things that are organic means they're made from another living species. Uh, unless you consider the earth to be alive, which whatever, don't do that to me. Um, it's not, right? So everything here is made by another animal with the exception of minerals that are just simply taken from earth. They're rocks, basically. Google periodic table if you want to learn more about that. The little purple triangle you're going to see signifies it has an acute. And by acute, I mean like something on the order of hours or days response. Why is this above macros? Well, if you consume, say, 600 grams of carbohydrate or 48 grams of fat or, or whatever, differing amounts of different macros will give you an acute or, you know, chronic or acute uh, hours to days feeling. So if you have that 600 car grams of carbohydrate meal, 10 or 15 or maybe an hour or two later, you will feel that. It's also something that you probably need to pay attention to within your different meals. That's not true for vitamins and minerals. You can't tell, oh my gosh, I just had a lot of vitamin A, or my selenium is really high in this meal. And in fact, you don't even need to probably change it with, you know, to balance your selenium um, and your sodium and potassium intake throughout the day for the most part. This is something that doesn't change usually uh, until you get to multiple days or weeks. Another point on that, you can see differences in what, by changing your macronutrients pretty quickly but you don't really see that. So fixing deficiencies or toxicities in minerals and vitamins probably takes you weeks, if not months, where you, if you are deficient in carbohydrate right now, one meal can almost, you know, can have resounding effects on that. So that's my distinction between kind of acute or not. Coming into our non-nutrients, I break it into three categories. Other, just because that's an unending list of things. But the two controversial ones are fiber and phytochemicals. Now, You'll see the purple triangle above fiber because again, if you had like take 50 grams of psyllium root, you will feel what fiber does very acutely. Not the same thing for micronutrients. So if you've got extra polyphenols in a, a, some blueberries, you're not gonna feel that until you know, days or weeks later. You've got the blue, uh, Carolina blue lines here because again, like your minerals and vitamins, we typically say, hey, don't consume less than this amount of fiber, or right? don't consume less than these amount of phytochemicals. Now the phytochemicals we'll talk a little bit later and a lot more in separate videos. We don't have good numbers on those because we're only just learning about them in general. We know a lot more about fiber. In fact, we can even split that up like I've done in the uh, Why You Fart series of videos into soluble fiber and insoluble fiber and we can distinguish things there. But for the now, I'm just kind of calling it all globally fiber. So the little colored background, I guess you'll call that like a greenish, bluish, weirdest thing, for fiber signifies that a lot of people consider it to be a non-nutrient. Now, I should have said this at the very beginning, but there's not perfect agreement among nutritional scientists what falls into all these categories. So some folks say that fiber is a nutrient, some don't. Same with phytochemicals. So there's not perfect distinction here. With fiber, it's technically and generally considered to be a non-nutrient because it's not used in growth, it's not used in survival, though you could question that a little bit, and it's not used in reproduction. You can't use it for metabolism, but of course, as we just talked about, some forms of fiber you can partially digest. And you can make an argument, well, the bacteria in my gut digest them, and then I get those byproducts in terms of ketones and short-chain fatty acids. Okay, so again, there's an argument that can be made here. And certainly it's not excreted for structure. So your, <laughs> your hair and nails and stuff are not made of fiber. So to me, I give it its own separate distinction. I call it technically not a nutrient, but it's obviously very important. You would not want to go a day or you know many hours, but really even more than a couple of days without or very low fiber. Um, you could seriously have major health problems. Now it's basically impossible to do that unless you have some very restrictive or very weird diets. So for the most part, it's not something you have to worry about getting a minimum of uh, or getting a maximum. Phytochemicals are also a little bit different, okay? So they are technically non-nutrients, though, as I've said, and this is the last time I will, this is changing rapidly. We've just started to learn about phytochemicals really in the last 10 years, and so some of them are now being considered to be 
um, nutrients, others are not. They're not used in growth, reproduction, for metabolism, or excreted. However, you can make a strong case phytochemicals are absolutely necessary for survival, especially mid to late stages of life. Doesn't seem like you absolutely have to have them for pre-puberty, although my guess is we will learn that that is the case eventually. Um, but we just don't have the science. So don't think of this as they've been proven to not be important. Think of this as we just don't know yet. So technically we can't scientifically say yes. Um, with the exception of more and more data coming out on the survival aspect of phytochemicals and phytonutrients. So that's why it gets its own green text and black box and saying it's not technically a nutrient according to many, but it's important and basically a nutrient. In fact, I would imagine if I redo this video in a, some amount of short years, I will slide that over into the nutrient category. Now, as I mentioned, I will cover the phytochemicals a lot in separate videos because there's over 25,000 of them and that list is growing. You can basically split them into two major categories, carotenoids and polyphenols, and those are sub then subdivided into dozens and countless other subcategories. So I'll leave phytochemicals and, um, in fact, some people call them phytonutrients for that same argument. But phytochemicals is the better term. Let's move on and then talk about your macros. You're more familiar with these and the major distinction between a macro is two things here. Number one, you see that they now have a pinkish line, and that's because we tend to give people recommendations in terms of don't exceed this amount. So you'll notice with fiber, phytochemicals, minerals, and vitamins, we say don't have less than this, but with macros, we tend to tell people don't have more than this. Now, of course, there are minimum requirements for these macros. Again, they're, they're needed, right? Uh, you would survive or starve, I mean, without them, but that's... I'm talking about the general guidelines, right? So don't have more than this amount, this amount, this amount, etc. The orange box surrounding them signifies that these are converted into smaller molecules in the process of releasing energy so that we can make what's called ATP. And the final product is CO2 and H2O. Now this is again different because you cannot use minerals or vitamins or most of fiber and no phytochemicals for energy. So this is it. When we say macronutrients, these are the three we're generally talking about. And of course, the fourth one being water. Now, water is special because it is the inverse. We typically say, don't consume less than X amount and see any of my videos on optimizing hydration for those numbers. Water is also special because it is the one macronutrient that is not caloric. It's not used for energy production in any way. And technically it should have like a, a gold box because it of course is inorganic, all right? Uh, it's the only other one I was alluding to earlier that's on this list that doesn't have a carbon molecule attached to it. The other fun distinction about water is it is the only thing on this list that is absolutely essential and required for all living beings, right? So as I said earlier, some animals and organisms, they may or may not need uh, protein or carbs or other things, but water is essentially and required for everything that is alive, which makes it very unique and special. And why we always tell you, make sure you're super hydrated. Let's start with the first macronutrient, and that is protein. And you can generally split this into three major categories. The first one being the black box, and these are what are considered to be non-essential nutrients. Again, does not, or amino acids rather, does not mean they are unimportant, it simply means you do not have to consume them in your diet because your body can produce enough of them on its own or endogenously, that's what that means. The other category are the essential ones, which are the exact opposite, you have, so you have to consume these in your diet. And again, we have the blue line there, so we tend to say, here's the minimum amount of valine or tryptophan, etc., to consume. It's also blue because they are essential. The, I'm not gonna go through all nine of the essential ones in this video, that again will be in separate ones, but the one thing I do wanna draw your attention to is leucine, because we know that has a particularly important role with things like muscle growth, with exercise. And since I'm an exercise scientist, that's the thing I care most about, all right? I don't really care about other stuff. Obviously, the only thing in this world I'm consumed about is maximizing muscle. I mean, I know I didn't need to say that because look at me, but you get it. The third category here under protein is what are, are things that are called conditionally essential. So your body can produce these on their own, but in some special circumstances, it can't produce enough. This is classic and common with things like fetal development or maybe even prepubescent 
Or even as adults, things like if you're trying to maximize hypertrophy, you might be able to create some arginine or glycine, but you maybe don't produce enough to maximize muscle growth. So that's what it means to be conditionally essential, and that's why those boxes are outlined in blue. Moving over to fat, you've got, wait a minute, why did I skip carbs? Oh, that's right, folks. They're not essential. Don't shoot me. It doesn't mean they're not needed or important, or you can perform optimally without them. I didn't say any of those things. You're liars. I didn't say that. I just mean technically they're not essential because your body can produce a ton of them. Okay? I can't wait to see people misuse what I just said there. Anyways, on to fat. Three major categories here. The first one is what I call the rest. And that's because there are a ton of fatty acids and I did not want to take the time or honestly the space to list them all here. So you can look all those things up and those are clearly in black so they're non-essential. Doesn't mean they're not important, you, I'm not, you get it. The other two categories, conditionally essential, DHA, which is an omega-3, so why that three is there, and gamma-linoleic acid, an omega-6. So these are very common, for example, you need these to consume these when you're developing as a young child because DHA in this example is so important for brain development. But by the time you can become an adult, um, it, again, it moves into non-essential. It doesn't mean you don't want to consume it or that you wouldn't benefit from consuming more, um, but they're technically non-essential. The two essential amino acids are here and often difficult to pronounce, so we'll go slow. The first one is alpha, 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 linolenic acid, and that's an omega-3 fatty acid. The second one is simply linoleic acid, so notice the difference at the end there. Functionally, what that means is you have to consume enough of them, and again, we've got a blue line there because we say make sure you get at least this minimal amount in. So a lot of folks don't realize that these two fatty acids are actually essential. Moving on then to your minerals. When we typically say macro, we almost always assume you're talking about protein, carbs, and fat. But a, a common distinction here are your macro minerals. And they're called that because, as you can see in blue, they are essential. But two, because they're consumed in really high quantities. Uh, think of things like calcium. Um, you're probably getting prescribed grams per day. The rest of the things on this list you'll see are almost always milligrams per day or micrograms per day. So we call these your macro minerals. Now you'll also notice that there's a little bit of distinction here. There's a red line outlining the minerals and that's because there are what I call to be toxicity limits. There are known and somewhat realistic toxicities associated with this. Now, as I've said a thousand times, everything has a hormetic curve. Everything has a toxicity dose, right? You can eat too many carbs and die. You could eat too much fiber or water and drown, etc. So everything has a deficiency and a toxicity limit. But we make special distinction here because I, this is what I call them, they're somewhat realistic. It is very difficult to, be, to reach toxic levels of any of the things on this list with just normal food consumption. Most of the problems we see here are from supplementation. Now that's not always the case and I'll delineate that out in many separate videos, but that's generally the rule. So that's again why I call it known and somewhat realistic. If we go back to the example of fiber, one of the other reasons people don't technically call it uh, a nutrient is because it does not have a known deficiency or toxicity limit. But the minerals we do, so we have a pretty good idea of what happens when you have this below this minimal threshold of chloride or this minimal threshold of calcium or whatnot. And by the same token, what the opposite or upper limit is what they'll call these things uh, nutritionally. And th think of sodium, right? That's the easiest example. Uh, very commonly, way too much sodium is consumed in people who don't exercise and consume way too much overly processed or oversalted foods. Athletes, folks that eat mostly natural or whole real foods, don't have that issue. So they can have much higher sodium concentrations um, and, and not worry about it. Okay? You can see the hydration videos and some other videos I'll do on electrolytes and salt in general. Our next category though of minerals is what we call trace or ultra trace. And that's generally because in the pink box you consume less than 100 milligrams per day. Again, that's sometimes like a 10th or a 50th of the amount of say sodium or chloride you'd consume in a day. So it's very small amount. So it, they are clearly very important. They have known toxicity limits. So they're still under the umbrella of the red of the mirror. And you can see the whole list of them there. Iron, zinc, copper, iodine, etc. 
also still essential. You'll notice everything so far under the category of mineral is considered essential, and then there is the rest, right? So there's all kinds, and again, an unending list of these things, just to look at your periodic table, right? Fluoride and bromide and, and um, arsenic and aluminum and all of these things. We don't know that you need to have any of these really in your body, and some of them are actually very toxic very quickly. And they're very, they're generally, they're, um, even though there's things like arsenic and peaches and stuff like that, it's such an incredibly small amount that it, it doesn't have any functional role. Moving on into our last core category of vitamins. We break these up into two separate uh, types of vitamins, fat-soluble and water-soluble. So the fat-soluble ones I can split up and give three major distinctions. So we're talking about vitamins A, E, K, and D. Now D is separated and you can see it's actually conditional because as we know, we can get vitamin D from the sun. So it is essential, we have to have a certain amount of it, but we don't necessarily have to have it from our diet, we can get it from the sun. So it's a little bit separated over there. Now technically, all of your vitamins have known and somewhat realistic toxicity levels, but I frankly don't agree with most of them. A is fairly common, especially with supplementation. There are very known, very quick, and, and very realistic problems with overconsumption of vitamin A. Vitamin E and K technically have limits, but I don't really see it in the data. I haven't seen that many examples of people having huge problems with E and K, even with supplementation. And vitamin D especially. Uh, a typical dose of vitamin D is like 5,000 IUs per day. Uh, there are many reports of people taking 10, 12, 15 times that for months on end and not really having any problems. And so I don't really, if you look at the textbooks, you're gonna see vitamin D is a toxicity, but I honestly don't really consider it to be that big a deal. Also, because the fix is so easy, if you just reduce the vitamin D intake or just take it way down, then it goes back to normal pretty quickly. So it's not really one that I consider to be, you know, a big concern for toxicity. In terms of your water soluble ones, now the major distinction here between fat soluble and water soluble is technically what they dissolve in, but for your body, it means this. The fat soluble ones you store, so this is one of the reasons why vitamin A, which is I, I'm pretty sure primarily stored in the liver, has a toxicity problem because if you do overconsume it, it will be stored and that increase in stored abundance is where the problems start. The fat soluble ones, if you don't eat them or don't, if you overconsume them, they're generally just going to get excreted in urine. So they have a much lower chance of causing toxicity. So you don't even see any of those on the board here. Again, I, I know you can technically get vitamin C toxic, but you're going to pee most of it out and it's not going to have any problems. It doesn't mean you want to just overconsume any of the water soluble ones prophylactically. In fact, we have seen cases of excess vitamin C and vitamin E consumption blocking things like exercise adaptation. So reducing hypertrophy and stuff like that. So I will talk in separate videos about how you optimize these levels. And, um, so there's no just like free passes. You can't just consume vitamins um, and nauseam. But we don't have a super huge issue with if you take double or triple the amount of RDA recommendations of, you know, thiamine or something or riboflavin, you're going to be just fine for the most part. All right. So again, I'll talk about all those videos later. So that's it. I think we finished in around 25 minutes or so. So hey, if you're new, this is pretty good. As I mentioned, be on the lookout for all these other videos I've got coming on the realms, particularly of the nutrients. So I've, I've done a lot on the macros. You can check all those out. I'd recommend starting with the, um, you know, clearing the, uh, clarifying the confusion videos with the macro, with the protein, carbs, and fat type of stuff. Um, see the fart videos for anything you want to know about fiber. See the hydration videos for anything you want to know about water. And in the next, well, basically the rest of this year, I'm going to be dropping a ton on the other stuff, phytochemicals, minerals, and vitamins. That's all coming down the pipe. So again, I appreciate all your support. Hope you enjoyed this. If you want to support what I'm doing, you know what to do. Subscribe, like, all that stuff, share it around. That's honestly the best way. So thank you for your attention. Hope you enjoyed. And we will see you later for a fantastic discussion of some really small nutrients that are going to make your life a little bit better and probably perform better. Peace out. Guys.